Today is Thursday, June 13th. My name is Teresa Beer Larson. I am talking with Carl Bliley okay. at the Collegiate United Methodist Church in Ames. He also wears some other musical hats, so to speak, and we'll be talking about the music Antiqua today. Carl, do I have your permission to record your voice and yes. uh, your face today? Thank you very much. Uh, the music Antiqua has a distinguished and long history at Iowa State University. Can you tell me when and how it got started? The Music Antiqua actually not as an ensemble, but as a group of people joining together to play early music, started uh, about 1967, I believe. Uh, when I was not here, I was in uh, Minneapolis at the time, and Ed Weiss had a lute. And he persuaded the, uh, the university administration to buy a recorder and also, I think, a crumhorn it was. And so Ed met with a couple of other people from the university and played early music. Uh, then I returned uh, back to the university about 1968 or 9, and I was presented with one of my tasks. And that task was to direct Musica Antiqua, or this early music group. I had no idea about any of the instruments. I was totally green. I was close to a doctorate in musicology, but not even close to anything, even a grade school elementary degree in early instruments. And so I stood in front of the group, my first occasion, and I played the crumhorn. I played the entire piece a third lower than it was written. Uh, can you imagine the <laughs> looks on the performers as this is the guy who is going to take over my the Musica Antiqua? <laughs> I learned quickly. <laughs> <laughs> we will see some of the music, uh, musical instruments later, but let's follow up a little bit of, on the history. So this really got started with money from Iowa State University as a part of the Iowa State University experience. Tell me a little bit about what some of your early performances were. Well, the early, one of our earliest performances was, is, uh, was at the University Madrigal Dinner. And uh, we performed from the stage. We just sat there and performed from the stage. No moving around. And of course, with the talk at the Madrigal Dinner and with the instruments not being very loud, we were hardly heard at all. So it was not an auspicious beginning. Let's talk a little bit about these instruments. Where are they made and who makes them now? At the moment, it's very difficult to purchase these instruments. The, each one of them is crafted individually. There are no, there's no factory line to make them like Yamaha, uh, making the plastic recorders. And so back many years ago, back in the 70s, there seemed to be a mood for early music. However, uh, these instruments then were created by craftsmen who looked at museum models and then they took the measurements, they looked at uh, drawings from the period, they took the measurements, and then they craft, crafted each individual instrument. The problem with that, of course, is that each individual instrument is different, and so their fingerings are different. Now, there's not, there's not a great deal of universities that had, at, at, at Weiss, uh, who was pushing this because he liked that early music. And so, um, but at that time, there were f a few. And these instruments then were bought by them, made out of very good woods or out of plastic. <laughs> and so uh, that's the early history of it. What has happened now, the builders have gone out of business because there's not a great market for these instruments. And so the instruments we have, most of them are irreplaceable. What a treasure. I think so, yes. <laughs> Let's go back a little bit to the performance um, aspects of Music Antiqua, where you've been and uh, what enrichment you've brought to the state of Iowa in terms of, I mean, this is not music that's played on the radio all the time. Not often. <laughs> Tell me then, when did you start branching out from just Iowa State performances? 
Well, we started playing, as I say, with the Madrigal Dinner, and then we, we gave a few concerts. Uh, remember, we were small, and we had very few instruments. But then I had this crazy idea of applying to the Iowa Arts Council. It was the Arts Council at that time. And uh, in 1969, and believe it or not, we received a grant. Uh, nobody else had applied for this kind of thing, it's, and I'm not so sure the people on the committee knew what we were talking about, but it sounded interesting. Uh, and so we actually received a grant, and we played, I believe it was in Muscatine, so we had about four different uh, concerts at that particular uh, time. These were formal concerts. Uh, in 1970, then I applied for a grant, and we did not get it. In 1971, I again applied for a grant, and since 1971, we have been supported by the Iowa Arts Council and now the Department of Cultural Affairs. And so, implicit in that is that outreach, that you will do performances all across the state. We will do performances anywhere we are asked. <laughs> uh, we do not have a publicity agent, and so I don't think we have ever hustled a concert. And they've all come by word of mouth or through the Iowa Arts Council or mm -hmm. through people who have known us and uh, gone to other states. I have seen some of your presentations, and when people hear medieval or early music, they might think it's stuffy. Your presentations are not stuffy. No, they are not, because we have... We have a group of comedians uh, who, and, and we play off of each other. Uh, we, so to speak, <laughs> castigate some of them. I have uh, I have several lines to use for some of the people, and of course they have lines for me. Uh, so that uh, that's the kind of uh, ensemble we have, kind of the camaraderie. But what we do, and I think this is the most important, is when we play a concert, we play many, many different kinds of instruments. We just don't play a recorder or play a lute. We will play sackbuts, we will play crumb horns, hurt and shawmai, we will play the horns of animals, we will even play a bladder pipe, which indeed has a bladder on it uh, in order to blow through it. <laughs> And of course, you can imagine the, one of the great lines I have. Uh, uh, the reason I look so so uh, so tight and, and so nervous in uh, in playing it is because I have to play with a full bladder. And that is going to get a laugh that, every time. Oh, that gets a tremendous amount <laughs> of laughter. Yes, if it, if it's presented of course. well, it, uh, uh, slowly enough that they can comprehend what you're saying. Yeah. Do you find any kind of audience that's more receptive than another? Any kind of art? Audience. Audience. I think one audience that I recall was at Mercy Hospital down in Des Moines. We were doing a Christmas program from them. And uh, I would say that the staff uh, had, had a great amount of wine. And so during our performance, the king and the queen got under the table and started lifting it up. And it was total, total chaos. Uh, we played anyway, we took our check and left and vowed we would never play for Mercy Hospital anymore. But they were having fun, so uh, what's the difference? That's our main point, is to have fun and enjoy the concert. And what do you think the concerts were like in medieval time? Do you have any idea? Maybe the Mercy experience might have been consistent with what was happening in medieval times. Oh, too. I'm sure. I, I don't think in a banquet a king is going to be listening to a, 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 a lute or a gamba. No, they're going to be talking. It's background music in many cases. And in the madrigal dinner, it's background music. We go to the table. Sometimes the people at the table are quiet and listen to us. Sometimes they continue eating. Sometimes they continue talking. Well, we just go to the next table and play again. And, and there's always some group that's receptive. The, the audience is made of all kinds of people. Some very interested in the instruments and uh, asking the history behind it, where they come from, and other ones will just <laughs> go. And do you find that there's a difference between audiences of children versus audiences of adults, for example? It depends on the principle. Now we have played recently, this past April, in Marshalltown. We gave eight concerts there. And the superintendent, I should say the superintendent, the superintendent of the school was there. And those kids listened, and they were respectful, and they walked in and out.
quietly. It was almost like an ROTC drill. But, but they, and they also ask intelligent questions. Except one little kid was wondering why uh, we have an instrument that's called the sackbut. It's a trombone. And she said, I'm, I, I was disappointed that you didn't play the butt sack. And, you know, <laughs> okay, they, they got it switched around, but somebody had been teaching them about the sackma, and so that is all good. They were, they were prepared for it. Oh, they were, oh yeah, the schools are, are much more prepared for it, I mm -hmm. think. The teachers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have the students in the schools sing along with us. There's mm -hmm. some lovely nursery rhymes from the time of uh, King James I, and we, 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 we send the music beforehand, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they sing along. What is the repertory like? Do you think you have researched the entire repertory, and you you fairly you have a fairly good understanding of what to play, or are there still things being discovered? Well, I'm sure there are a lot of manuscripts that have never been discovered. Maybe no more need to be discovered. Uh, there's enough variety of what, what we have. We try to pick out uh, what we think are the top tunes to play. And uh, then, then we orchestrate them. Who knows how they orchestrate it? You can look at the paintings, and you can look at the drafts, and, and you see the instruments. Like over there on the bulletin board, we have a guy playing, I don't know how many instruments. Uh, and what was he playing? We have no idea what he's playing, so it's, it's a matter of... Uh, There's um, some guesswork there. Oh, uh, and one thing I... I, I uh, the music we play, <clears throat> some of it is very, very body. In fact, we have a program called Pornography in Music of the Middle Ages and Renaissance. I did not have to search very long to find music for with that particular topic. I must say we have not done it very often. People have not wanted it, uh, but uh, maybe, maybe some group one day will, will, will like to do that. And I remember that in Dyersville, when we played in Dyersville at the Basilica, that uh, we, uh, we performed a concert there in the church itself. The priest saw the program and he went into the high altar, took up the, uh, the candle that had the guy as Jesus or God was there and moved it into a side chapel so that God would not hear all of the raucous things that we were playing. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things that I think ever happened. One thing that occurs to me is that instruments of modern times can be used for different kinds of uh, music and in different kinds of settings. And honestly, you're telling me that these early period uh, instruments were probably used for sacred things as well as for the body or secular ones as well. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> choirs, even with the main cathedrals and basilicas uh, in the Renaissance, uh, did not have, I don't think they were very good choirs. Uh, boys were singing the upper parts. And uh, we, we can have some wonderful boys' choirs, but when you think of all the churches and all the basilicas there, uh, where are you going to find these boys who can sing in tune? And so, uh, at San Marco in, in uh, Venice, which we just visited a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, they have divided balconies up in the front so that one choir could be here, one choir could be on the other side, and they could do this antiphonal kinds of music. Uh, and what they had, however, they had zincs, cornetto, playing the upper parts, the altos and sopranos to keep them on pitch. Uh, they had the butt sa I mean the sack butt. <laughs> they had the sack butt to keep the tenors on pitch. And then they had the serpent. And this is an instrument, I hope I can find, maybe I can, uh, in here. But it looks like a serpent. It's, it's curved like a serpent and plays the bass line. And it is the most unstable instrument I have ever in my life heard. Because you, on those instruments, you can almost play an entire scale using no fingers whatsoever. Just using, using your lip. And, and who kept the serpent on? Uh, on I, I, have, I, I have no idea. But yes, they were used a great deal. And they still are used. You know, Heinrich Schutz and Gabrielli, they wrote pieces for multiple choirs. Mm -hmm. Four choirs at once. 
And actually, you anticipated one of my next questions, and that was, are these instruments ever used to play, you might call it contemporary music, or are they best sound, is there best sound with music that was designed and conceived at the time that the, the musical instruments were conceived? Several composers, or a few, have written music for early instruments. The problem that exists is they are not aware of the limitations on these instruments. And when I say limitations, I mean limitations of how, what the, the range that they have, uh, limitations on how well you can play them in tune. Uh, remember back in the Renaissance, what was the one flat that could be used? A B flat. Was it an F sharp? Yes, occasionally, but what went past an F sharp or an F sharp in G major or a B flat and F major? They weren't on the instrument. You couldn't play. You could cross finger them, but they sounded horrid. And so, uh, if modern day composers do not understand that the instruments, <laughs> each of the instruments, uh, then then the music just will not sound. Mm -hmm. On the other hand. Uh, music Antiqua several years ago recorded the background music for a Dragonlance series. And the composer of that music knew relatively well the instruments and the limitations. And so when he presented that music to us to perform, we could pick out the instruments that would work, and they did work. And so that is the part of the background of that, uh, that movie. I'm, I'm going to say just a little bit about how I experimented before we started talking with this beautiful flute. I'm an amateur flute player. It was so difficult. I struggled. It's, it's not easy for you to use these things. Well, you're all accomplished musicians, so maybe it's easier. Yes, but also, do you remember how many years we have been playing? Mm -hmm. Musica was, Antica was founded in, oh, uh, say 1967 or so, and uh, you know what year it is now. <laughs> 2013. That's a long time to learn each individual instrument, to purchase new ones, and then to learn those. Once you have the basic concept, you're okay. And then you just have to fiddle with mm -hmm. half holes, and yet you would have to fiddle, or to find out that, yeah, you had to turn the flute so you could get a sound out of it. Uh, but each one of those is different, but the experience mm -hmm. really allows you then, when you pick up an instrument, you say, aha, I know this instrument. Yes. Uh, because of its feel, because the whole finger holes were different places, and so you automatically then adjust on your mind what the fingering is for that particular. Um, how unique is the music Antigua group across the United States? How many are left? Who's doing this? Mostly the groups uh, are associated with uh, universities, but universities are not about to pay money for these instruments. There's a, a recorder we have that costs $6,000. And uh, a lot of our instruments are well over two to three thousand dollars, mainly because they are good instruments, and also they're they're antiques, you might mm -hmm. say, even though they were only made in the past fifty some years. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some performing groups. There used to be the New York Pro Music Hall, but they folded a long time ago. And uh, I think the Waverly Concert is there. I, there are occasionally symposia that are held, and early music groups. Uh, get together. One of our performers, uh, Douglas Kirk, uh, who was here many years ago, uh, is now a very accomplished zinc player and cornetto player, and he records with the Gabrielli Consort, uh, uh, which uh, records in Europe constantly, and they're mm -hmm. an extraordinary group. Uh, but they are rare. Mm -hmm. They are rare. So would you say there might be one active uh, high-functioning music antique group per state, or, or more than that? I would say less, mm -hmm. fewer, fewer than Okay. Anyone. So you, let's talk about, just briefly, because I know there have been lots and lots of people that have been associated with music antique, but tell me about the current performers, and then we'll go back and maybe get some alums. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, earlier or, or now? Uh, the current performers, the right. Cur current performers. Uh, we have four current performers and occasionally one or two dancers, depending on what, what the group wants us, what the uh, concert association wants us to bring. 
Uh, one of them is Alan Sponheimer, who was at the head of the Ames Historical Society for a while. And uh, he's an extraordinarily accomplished musician. In fact, there was a review by a person uh, in a major uh, consort that said Alan Sponheimer was the best sackbut player he had ever heard. And that is a compliment. That is a compliment. He could pick up any instrument and, and almost master it mm -hmm. immediately. Double reeds, uh, serpent, he could play the sackbut, he could play uh, recorders, crumb horns, uh, and even the hurdy-gurdy and the bagpipes. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's any story you go. Uh, he, he has, in fact, he was one of the originators, original members of the group. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in high school at the time, I believe. <laughs> uh, and uh, another person who has been with the group uh, since early times is uh, Dee Driesen. Uh, Dee uh, is the bell choir director she, at the Collegiate Methodist, and she worked at the library for a long time. She's now retired. You know, Musica Antiqua, uh, we have a good name, right? <laughs> a descriptive name. And, and she is, again, she can, uh, uh, she can play the hammer dulcimer, she can play all the recorders, all, all the uh, crumb horns, the hurt and show am I, uh, just about anything under the sun as well. Uh, and then there's Steve Keller, who is from Fort Dodge. She comes down and, and, and plays. He's the lute player and the gamba player. So he is really, and the rebec player, he's a string player. Uh, <laughs> And he, actually he wrote, uh, when we played in Fort Dodge, he wrote for the paper a very good review of the Antiqua. And so, we offer, if you have such taste, we are, uh, why don't you come and join our group? And so he's now been a member, a member of our group. And then Valerie Williams, who is the uh, head of Dance Commotion, a professional dance group, uh, she is also an expert in early dances. And so she teaches, uh, she helps to teach the Madrigal Dinner dances here. And when we have Madrigal Dinner, she teaches them there. If we have concerts, we like to have the local people, local students uh, uh, perform dance. And she goes with us and in the afternoon teaches the dances, not the difficult ones. Uh, and then in the evening, the kids get up there and they perform. You can imagine what a hit that is to the, uh, to the audience. You know, hey, there are, are people uh, performing with us. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, those are the uh, five of the uh, four, counting mm -hmm. myself, people now who have been around. Mm -hmm. We're the small group. Mm -hmm. But I, then we have yes. <laughs> the music men. They sing with us occasionally, they record with us occasionally, and uh, they uh, are made up of, uh, they're all Iowa State, people, I believe, that most of them are retired now, and they perform the further than the quintet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then we have a, a brass group uh, that's also associated with the church that's called Collegiate Brass, but one of the brass players plays the serpent and the recorder, and another brass player played the Lissardin, or the Lizard, which is the tenor version of, the, of, of those instruments. Uh, and we have also, I think, uh, uh, Stephanie Sherwood is the one who organizes the, the trumpet players for the Madrigal Dinner. And so, but she's a horn player, but she, she, she plays some of the early instruments. We don't use them at all the time, as I was saying. Our traveling group is a small one that I mentioned. Yes. I think that it's time to hear some of these instruments. So we're going to pause and then we're going to um, pick up and hear some of the instruments. Okay, good. Carl, can you please describe your costume for me first? This is a 16th century dress that a university professor would have worn uh, in, in Europe at the time. Uh, this uh, and all of our costumes were made uh, by the uh, Iowa State University uh, Theater. Uh, and uh, each one of them mimicked a different kind of person. I, of course, had the doctor costume. Uh, and uh, Quick, do a spin for me so I can see what it looks like in back, the, your headdress and such. Yes, yes, all right. Thank you very much. Good, all right. <laughs> and they were all uh, created for, uh, from the latter part of the 16th century because the early part of history, medium history, had costumes, let's say, were body-fitting. 
And as we change, <laughs> individuals or as our bodies change, you know, <laughs> they need to play, have room to let out. And so that's why the late 16th century uh, was chosen. Okay. Um, we'd like to hear some music. How about, I've been interested in that organetta. That's just got to be one that we hear first. <laughs> Carl, can we talk a little bit about um, what this might have been used for or how it was made? Obviously, it has to be played seated. Actually, it could be carried in a procession, but uh, the pipes are of 90% lead, and you can imagine how heavy that might, might be. Uh, this is a very rare instrument for today. Uh, it was made uh, several years ago, but it was co uh, made from a copy of a painting, uh, an instrument was on the painting of a, a port of, of a uh, painting by Hans Memling. Hans Memling was a German uh, who moved up to Flanders, and he had a series of early instruments on one of his paintings, and right in the middle was the organetto. And so the builder looked at that organetto in the painting and recreated this from scratch. Pipes were all made, everything was made from hand. Now, if you look closely, you can see it has a keyboard, just like a modern-day keyboard, except the little pegs there. And it has about two octaves in one note range. The pipes, as I say, were made out of uh, uh, a lead, which gives it a very lovely tonal quality. And the back has a bellows. So I pull this bellows out. Air enters into the bellows, and then when I push this up, and put the, my finger on a key, then the, uh, a sound, uh, a sound comes out. What will we hear? What, great. What would you like to play for us? Just a, a couple of phrases. Oh, one, one, of one other thing yes, I want yes. to say about this is, if you look carefully, you will see the inlay. There is inlay. Each one of these is different, and on the back, you also see some very elaborate inlay. I'll just play a few, a few notes on here. You notice I had to breathe. Uh, I had to breathe by pulling the bellows back and getting more air because <laughs> it's hard work. On an accordion, you can do it either <laughs> either way, and you'll still get a sound. But here, uh, no, you have to breathe like a singer would uh, would would breathe. I have a quick question. You showed me some decoration on the back, but people don't get to see that decoration. I mean, it, it, it's a beautifully crafted instrument. I think it's a comment on society today and uh, how, how excellent things should be. In the Middle Ages, the concept was is God can see the back of the instrument, and so therefore, why make it plain? because God can see the entire instrument. And so these instruments, just as niches, uh, uh, statues and niches, uh, will be completed on the backside, because even though people can't see them, God can. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about this instrument that to me looks like a piece of an animal. It is indeed a piece of an animal. It is an African ox horn. And uh, somewhere along the line, it was made into an instrument. Now, I would imagine some shepherd out in the field who found one of these, uh, uh, these, these things uh, lost from a, uh, a cow, that would maybe have pulled this out and said, hey, maybe I can do something with this. And so clean out the, uh, the, the horn and put a, uh, some plaster of Paris, I think, on the other side, a little hole up there, maybe you can see, that you blow into. Okay, I just, uh, would you just, I'm gonna show you that hole. That is very small. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll see. hear the rest and of it. And put a wind breaker here so that you can, uh, uh, the sound will break up and make the sound. And then you drill holes. Mm -hmm. There is a big problem with this. Every horn is different of an animal, right? Where do you drill the holes? Well, here's what you do. You, let's say this hole here. Mm -hmm. You drill a little tiny hole, and then you blow through it and listen to it. And if it's flat, then you make the hole 
a little the, 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 uh, the way in which you enlarge the hole so it'll be sharp. sharp. If it's sharp, you then you make the hole bigger, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so therefore it'll be flatter. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, he didn't get the quite there, the right one there. Uh, he oh, did a pretty good job with that one, and a real nice job with that one. Uh, and this maybe just so-so. And so it's a matter of uh, what would the sound be? Yes. Isn't that a beautiful? It's sound very from, soothing from from a horn. <laughs> it is from, and uh, this is an alto. Mm -hmm. This is a bass. Makes sense to me. That's a bass, and actually, uh, this is a great bass. And uh, I, and I can understand if you tip that just towards me just a little bit. I can understand what you were saying about placing the holes in different places and different fingering and to get the tone that you wanted it would not be consistent because you could pick up another horn like that and the holes might be in different places tell me about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right <laughs> exactly. but now let me show you another instrument When you turn the thing around and blow in this end and leave this end open, it is a loud sound to say the least. That's a call to war. Or what, what uh, denomination, uh, what religion would use this? Uh, maybe Muslim. Or call, call to prayer. The shofar. Yes. The shofar, yes. And mm -hmm. you could hear this from the top of uh, the building there. Exactly. Uh, but you notice there. Yes that it could play. <laughs> Not a very stable sound. No. But you can get different notes. Now the shofar would not have these holes. Right, that would just somewhere be the... Along, yeah, somewhere along the line, somebody said, hey, maybe we can turn this into a, a, an instrument that will play different notes. Okay. And remember back at that time, there were not that many notes available. <laughs> Do you notice any similarities? Well, first of all, it's curved. It's curved. And the holes are irregular. It has holes in it. Am I doing okay as a student? You're doing excellent. <laughs> and, and it has a mouthpiece. Uh-huh. And it has an the opening. opening. Mm -hmm. And it is a piece of wood and it is covered with leather. Oh, I can't tell that. It from is where covered. I, with, I, I ah. guess you can't. It, it, it's covered with leather. Okay, that's different then. And this is the instrument that developed from yes. this one, and this is the instrument that would have kept sopranos and altos on tune when they sang music from the Renaissance, particularly in the high cathedrals. Now it has been. It, it, it's an instrument that's unstable. <laughs> You didn't even finger. No, I, I use absolutely <laughs> no fingering. Uh, because uh, you have, if you think the note, you'll mm -hmm. probably get it, no matter what fingers it <laughs> holds. No, you might think it's very easy to play, mm -hmm. but I must say some of those notes were not that beautiful. Mm -hmm. Remember the French horn mm -hmm. in its high register plays. Just on uh, the just overtone plus. series like that, and you have uh -huh. to lift them up and mm -hmm. lift some of them down. Uh, but this is a, an instrument that supposedly sounded like a well-trained eunuch. That's interesting. <laughs> Who besides boys sang <laughs> the upper lines? Mm -hmm. Yes. In, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Eunuchs. Yes. This sounded like uh -huh. a eunuch. Uh, and was very, very popular. In fact, there were some very difficult pieces, sonatas in the early book, but written for uh, the zinc or the cornetto. Have you been to Italy? Yes. Have you had breakfast? Yes. What do you have in Italy as a breakfast dish along with your coffee? 
Lots of stuff. What What do you think? Cornetto. Of? Oh, cornetto. You yes. have a cornetto, and what do you think the shape of the cornetto is? There, right, right, like, like this. this. <laughs> That's where the shape comes okay. from. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's Let's move. Which one shall we do next, Carl? Uh, I don't care. It's up to you. Well, let's see. In my uninitiated way. I said, would you please play the J-shaped instrument, which I guess is called a crumb horn. That is correct, and it is shaped like the letter J, or like the handle of an umbrella, <laughs> or as we age in the Musica Antiqua, as a cane <laughs> that we can walk, walk with. We have larger ones that we would use uh, in that way. Uh, it is a sound that uh, has been described in many ways, uh, like a, a nest of uh, bees, uh, <laughs> uh, but it has... <laughs> has a buzzing sound, and it immediately draws amusement and smiles from the audiences that we play for, until I tell them that the Duke of Mecklenburg had a group of crumb horns play for his wedding. Now, and I also offer to the audiences, I say, if you would like for us to play for your wedding, uh, we would be glad to do that. Guess what? I have not had one response <laughs> for that. <laughs> but to me, that sounds quintessentially early music. I don't know what it is, but that sounds... That just says early music to me, that sound. It, it is, it's a, it's a double reed sound. And now this double reed uh, is I'll a, a I'll zoom in reed. so we can see this. Okay. Oh, and I like it. It's against your black, uh, good, your garb. Thank you. Perfect. All right. It says double reed. Please go on. It's a, but it is a plastic reed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the plastic that has been created for this is so close to a, a, a cane reed, then mm -hmm. you would be, it would be very difficult to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Why do we use these? Because when we play concerts, we play many different instruments and we pick them off of the floor and play them. Now, if you had to soak every double reed instrument we played, you can imagine how long, uh, how many intermissions <laughs> we would have in our concert. <laughs> and so we do cheat a little bit that way, but mm -hmm. we don't really think so because the sound is so, so, so similar. It's very, very, uh, it, yeah. it just says that to me. It just, yeah. it just says that to me. And with these, these, this is an alto. Mm -hmm. We have a soprano, we have a tenor, a bass, and a great bass. Mm -hmm. I think we, we need to also hear a recorder, heavens. That just seems to be like the uh, kind of the signature instrument of um, early music. And that one is big. And this one is called? What? And this one is? This is a bass recorder. Okay. It's a model after a series found in uh, a theory book Pictorius' Centagra Musicum. And so the builder looked at the, the, uh, the number of recorders there and we created this exactly. It only has one hole here, inside of here, and that is to protect the mechanism. But all the rest, as you can see, there's no... They're all open. No, what we call dental work mm -hmm. to give you different pitches. The sound is, uh, is quiet. Mm -hmm. But when you're playing in a, uh, a cathedral with stone walls or in a, a, a palace where you have small rooms and you have all this wonderful acoustic, it sounds really very loud mm -hmm. and very, very pure. Mm -hmm. And this, this, is a, uh, this is the base of that, uh, of that sound. That's, that sound. It's, it's beautiful. It's very beautiful. Why don't we finish up with one more? Which one would you like to do? <laughs> Which? Yes, that one looks good. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to need a chair for that. Okay. Please tell me the name of this instrument. And this instrument is called? This is called a symphony 
or sometimes its later version is called a hurdy-gurdy. Uh, the symphony, however, you will find many stained glass windows in medieval churches in Europe that will have the symphony on it. It's an angel mm -hmm. playing a symphony. Now, you have to hold it this way so that the keys that are there will fall down by gravity. And then when you push them, then of course, then they hit the key. Mm -hmm. uh, they hit one of the strings. Uh, it's turned. I did not expect that. It's turned by a crank. Mm -hmm. No, not myself, yes. but by the crank. Uh -huh. And you say, that is really a strange sound. Isn't yes. It? But if you look carefully, yes. inside, you will see there's this round disc. And when I turn this, it makes these strings sound. It's just like a, a, a bow on a violin, but this is the, the, the round bow. That makes sense to me. Okay. Now, you see there is a string here, and you see there's a string here yes. on the outside. Yes. There are actually four strings in here, but the two outer ones have no keys. See, these are the keys. And I do I, see that. And when I push this, mm -hmm. see, that, 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 that hits the string and makes it uh, smaller, so you get higher notes. No. And so, but these two are constantly sounding, mm -hmm. and they are called drones. Not the ones that fly over. <laughs> uh, and, As we've uh, been I, accustomed. I, I'm sure that Obama would not <laughs> ban these from, <laughs> from any of the uh, military Disguise. tactics. But these are drones. Now, can you think of any other instrument that has drones? That is notes to say the same. Uh, I can, but the, the name is not coming to my mind. Think of Ireland and so Scotland and the oh, bagpipes. Oh, yes, yes, of course. The bagpipes, a certain of, yes. the, of the pipes only sound two different. Usually they're a fifth apart. And they sound constantly. Mm -hmm. And if you think, and, and it's, a, it's a rural thing, because this is a musette, could be called a musette, and the musette also had this kind of... Uh, I should say, pastoral sound of the drones. Mm -hmm. And when Handel writes the pastoral movement from his Messiah, what do the lower strings play? Drone! Da da dee da da, but there you have the eh. mm -hmm. Because, of course, it's the shepherds coming down, and the shepherds are bringing their own thing. Now, all this symbolism uh, in, in these instruments the composers like to use. And that helps me, as a modern listener, appreciate some things that I've loved, but it gives a historical context. Well, they said, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd from the Messiah. What does that start off? The lower parts and the accompaniment. Same notes, the hill. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so, so I can play different notes. You can play a lot of melodies on here, but <laughs> here's the way you finger it. And it does sound like a bagpipe, absolutely. Yeah, it, it has a similar quality Sim to any similar kind quality. of a, an early instrument or a pastoral instrument. That, and why, the, why uh -huh. those two notes, the drones, should be associated, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, I want to thank you so much for this miniature concert and this wonderful lecture that involves the history of a group at Iowa State University that's had a profound influence over many decades. Thank you. You're thank very you so much. <laughs> But now, would you like to really be a teacher and, and include a recorder player as we close? I think so. I would like now to have an audition for a future member of Musica Antiqua. And uh, I believe most of you know her. She is TJ. Larson, and she is really under pressure at the moment playing the alto recorder. Are you ready? I hope I can cover up these holes adequately. <laughs> All right, but I think the important part of this is that the music antiqua experience really makes people want to feel involved. And so that's, that's my, 
my premise here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.